Okay, this lesson for the Cornet Project class, an extension of the IamCornet.org Apologetic and Outreach Ministry of Landmark Missionary Baptist Church. I remind you that uh, the most typical feature of the Greek mind is a sense of the fundamental unity in nature and of a wholeness of things. Holism describes this frame of mind. We can see this uh, where particular detail and individual character are firmly fixed into a universal frame. That's in Homer, an ancient Greek uh, text, says the modern intellectual tradition is to divide, to specialize, and to think in categories or assign to pigeonholes. We call it reductionism now, or more simply splitting. And uh, whereas the Greek instinct was to do the, exactly the opposite, uh, that's called lumping, that is to see things as an organic whole, Thus, even today, our scientific traditions can be split down the middle with one half being lumpers and the other half being the splitters. Lumpers group together as many things as possible. Splitters do not hesitate to create new categories whenever they see significant differences. I referenced in a, a different video and more than once about a 1978 publication by General Counsel of the Assemblies of God. You can get this online. It's uh, just got it yesterday, another one just to have for myself. And this is their, uh, they have a construct called the security of the believer. And they say it's by the exercise of free will, the believer becomes a child of God. And by the continued exercise of free will, he remains a child of God. To keep on believing is the believer's responsibility. Actually, that is um, something they did in trying to, co-mingle and blend, lump together uh, Calvinism, uh, where they say rightly uh, acknowledges God's sovereignty and divine, divine prerogative. Uh, and then also they say the Arminian stresses rightly uh, man's free will and responsibility. Then they tried to blend that together. It all turned into something that they're very bold about. I be quite honest with you, the free will movement uh, is not really what we'll be discussing today. We're talking about the free grace movement, in a blog article uh, written by Dr. Bob Wilkin, Wilkin excuse me. Uh, we're, we're just test that out to see. He mentions here that he came to faith in Christ for his eternal salvation nearly 50 years ago, 1972 actually. Uh, he was referring to, uh, we were concerned for everyone within Christendom who did not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I remember that very well. Actually, in 1972 is when I trusted Jesus for everlasting life. That was quite a specific emphasis that was made. Matter of fact, it's uh, those who believe in the Jesus for everlasting life have that life. And that was uh, really the core, those three elements, uh, who and whom and what would result. It's all there. It was a matter of fact, uh, as he points out in here, there weren't invitations for people to believe, nor were there discussions. We weren't going out preaching uh, the free will movement, which apparently in that you have libertarian compatible and very few people even know about the causal agency uh, in the hippil stem of the biblical Hebrew. I'm not sure how they could know that unless they actually used their King James Bible and saw places. So we'll just show that little triangle that I was showing before, how these things all together here, whatever this is to people who have no interest in defining the term, uh, it's quite interesting to know how little people know about that in which they find themselves uh, overly involved. Uh, and sometimes, uh, strangely, uh, they can be involved very uh, emotively uh, here, the Trinity, for example, I was just showing the consistency of the holy attribute, holy, 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 the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that holiness. Here's another, uh, the Holy Spirit is the uh, guarantee of the inheritance of us by the Father, and that's through the redemptive work of Christ. This is in Ephesians, so you can see that right there. Uh, the person, the Holy Spirit, fully God, Yet we have one being, three persons, uh, no modalism, no subordinationism, and no polytheism. So we got that cleared up. But here we have a, another example. And here, for example, this 
uh, continuationism, cessationism that so many speak of, the testimony of Christ, uh, the perfection. It's the perfective testimony. And Paul said, when that which is perfect is come, perfect is an adjective there, declines in all three genders, agrees with the object, uh, which it modifies ideally uh, in number, gender, and case. And in this case, the antecedent is in the first chapter, somewhere around verses 3, 4, 5, somewhere in there where he talks about the testimony of Christ. Fascinating would be the interest, very little interest people have in the testimony of Christ in the uh, gifts uh, that were uh, in operation, as we call it, or were continuing. And for those who say cessation without understanding the purpose of that, and the end to which, or those who say it continues ignoring the purpose and the implications of perfection, just shows another, uh, any of these taken apart without realizing there was an active uh, outward signification of these gifts and there was a purpose for this coming to an end and this purpose and result has implication, but all that works together. It's all about him. This is about the third well, we say third person of the Trinity, but certainly that's only our pragmatism. But the Holy Spirit uh, being the guarantee of the inheritance of us by the Father through the redemptive work. So there we have uh, the Trinity, holy, 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 the attributes. Uh, but back here, let's go over here to the free grace movement. Uh, he shows the concern because being in Christendom and being in Christ are two different things. And tr to trust in Christendom is not the same as to trust in Christ. So uh, it's very subtle because a lot of people, we like to think that, well, I identify with this religion, but as I use the example of politics, we don't uh, think, or nor does it often occur to us that if someone says they're Republican or Democrat, which that switch is size, the pendulum swings back and forth on that, but it doesn't often occur or ever occur to us that someone who says I'm a Republican, would we then think to ask, so where did you complete your degree in political science? And they'd be like, what do you mean? Why would I have a degree in political science just because I said I'm a Republican? Well, obviously uh, you can notice most people can more, more people identify with something, a political party, for example, than with political science. So notice how that's one step removed. So in this evaluation, just think of Christendom as one step removed from Christ, not closer to him, but removed. It's something other than Christ. So those who trust in their expression of Christendom, whether it be a theistic tradition or religious order or even a denomination, uh, that certainly is just one step removed. And yes, that concern was that everyone would have a personal relationship now, we'll get there in just a moment because here where Paul said, I know uh, in whom I have believed, that was perfect tense. He said, I have known uh, once for all, and it's uh, a word oida. It's a personal, it's insight word. It's a personal acquaintance with, uh, and I'm continuing to know. So it was perfect tense, past completed, once for all, continuing action in whom I have believe once for all and I'm continuing to believe and we'll talk about that in just a moment. Where did he get that perfect tense faith? How does that happen? Well, according to John 20, 31, the purpose of the miracles in John's gospel to be scripted. So we have scripted signs in their contextualized narratives. The purpose of those to be written along with and within the contextualized narratives were written and remain on record in order that those who read or hear uh, might deliberately cause ourselves to believe punctual action and in conjunction with that as ones who are believing continuously believing might have life in his name so the purpose of john's gospel was to result in life and the things jesus said specifically uh, several texts here uh, John 3, 16, 5, 24, 6, 35, 40, verse 47, chapter 6, 11, chapter 11, 25 through 27. He gives a lot of these. He also mentions Galatians 2, 16, uh, which we've said a lot about that. Uh, Galatians 3, 6 through 14, Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, Romans 4, 1 through 8, Acts 16, 31. Most of us, if you've done any work to evangelize, 
uh, take the gospel, that good news about Jesus. And here Paul had mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. You notice there's no contradiction there, but he makes a good point there. There are people who believe these facts here, but it doesn't mean they've ever trusted Jesus. It doesn't mean they trust him for everlasting life. Uh, there's people who can uh, perhaps re recite a creed, but where would we get this perfect tense faith? Well, John 20, 31, interesting, is actually, as you would expect, it's an elucidation of the perfect tense. It refers to puncture action, believe, and then the continuation. Well, what happened in between was what 1 John, sorry, not 1 John 1, 5, 1 John 5, 1, says that everyone who is believing, that's the continuous, has been previously fathered and are continuously being fathered, passive voice. Uh, it's uh, a perfect indicative passive. Yeah. And it is a finite verb, uh, has been previously, prior to this continuation, uh, fathered out from God and are always being fathered out from God. So this moment of faith here, and again, this would not be the free will movement because advocates of free will for some reason uh, seem to have more interest in whatever uh, they want to attribute to it. They attribute it agency. They give it uh, causation. Uh, they give it efficacy. Uh, now, I don't know why we have minds, we have, uh, we're a soul, we're a body, spirit, if you will, more of a dichotomy there in which we know the difference between spirit and body and that the body without the spirit's dead. And then we can notice features in that spiritual uh, side, if you will, of uh, mind and emotion and all the other things that we like to speak of, cognitive and affective sides of our being. However, whatever that is, we don't seem to speak of a, a free mind or a, uh, because we know Paul said that something took place in his life for him to be free to serve God with his mind. So we knew that that really wasn't, uh, and I'm not sure why that's not more self-evident, but Whatever the free will movement is, it seems to uh, really build a lot and into this, uh, not much about the grace of God. It certainly doesn't believe that those who believe in Jesus for everlasting life have that everlasting life because um, for them, uh, everlasting is, is just temporary. It's a relative term. It's a contingency upon the believer's responsibility to continue by the exercise of their free will to continue to believe. So uh, they're bold though. Now I have no qualms with someone being that bold to attribute to something so outwardly uh, because it certainly <laughs> makes it, uh, I have no inhibitions about attributing to the grace of God everything about my life. And I certainly have no, uh, would not be because of the grace of God ashamed of the gracious exemption from death because as one who believes punctual, simple form of action moment in Jesus for everlasting life that I have that. And Jesus would make that statement. He makes very good points here. He says there's a type of universalism uh, associated with Christendom where everyone within Christendom kind of, uh, you know, just assumes, well, we're all, uh, I guess, have everlasting life. But uh, he went on and said, but in the free grace movement, the FGM, uh, we know that only those who believe in Jesus, believe in Jesus for everlasting life, have that life. And then, of course, that long list. Now, why did uh, uh, God uh, teach? He asked the question, why did the Lord and his apostles teach such a narrow way? The word narrow actually refers to very specific and what I'd like to point out here is very fascinating in the free grace movement that I've been evaluating. Oh, here, Jesus, for example, the way, the truth, the life. See how all this is uh, lumped it together without breaking it apart. And then, of course, this, when I read this from the General Council of the Assemblies of God, 1978, and used it again in a video, 
and notice that um, they were trying to blend Calvinism and Arminianism. And I even mentioned that would be a train wreck because you have to know which parts of Calvinism make reference to the scripture and it's not a, a formed category, a word that is formed within the framework of Calvinism that then has a skewed definition that's fallible because even a Calvinist will tell you Calvinism is fallible and only the scripture is infallible. So that would place uh, blending fallible with fallible Arminianism, which is even further removed from the scripture than Calvinism, that is more fallible as what is much more severe. And to co-mingle that, uh, that's just, uh, well, you have uh, fallible times fallible. I'll just say it's fallible squared. It just, it's just getting worse when you try to co-mingle that. It's like not knowing causal agency of man and then trying to explain yourself according to what. So back to this, how, what do we do about this simple form of action? What do we do about this assertion that is so um, concise, it's simple, it's succinct, um, simple form of action. I said that because the aorist tense is the simple form of action. You can read it in the Koine Greek grammar, simple form of action, simple, uh, succinct, succinct and it's it's quite uh, it's kind of, it, it's very specific this narrow way he called it is so the narrow way narrow is specific and we know it's simple form of action this is simple action and that's the first action in John 20, 31. Even read, read it in the King James Version of the Bible for yourself. It says, believe. And then it says, believing. But believing is subsequent to this. 1 John 5, 1 made it so clear. The same author of John's Gospel said, the one who is believing. And then Paul said up here, that I know, have known, and am continuing to know the one in whom I have believed, punctual action, and am continuing to believe. He says, oh, I have known him, I'm continuing to know him, I am know the one I have known and continue to know the one in whom I have believed and am continually believing. So we have that uh, perfect tense faith. Uh, the perfect tense faith is here. In this, so it's narrow, it's specific, uh, it's succinct, and of course, simple. I'll put that there, and that's Koine Greek right there, Aris tense. Go ahead and write that out. So, Aris tense, simple kind of action. You couldn't have something more concise. This is all good news. And it's very specific. It leaves nothing out, however. The one who, those who believe, simple action, into Jesus, in Jesus for everlasting life, have that life. That's a fact. Indisputable, irrefutable. And uh, Paul the Apostle said it in 2 Timothy 1.12, uh, saying he has, he knows he perfectly, I have known and I'm continuing to know the one in whom he has believed. And the one in whom he has believed and is continually believing. So all that fits very well. And this is uh, very concise, very profound, very succinct. So uh, if you're not, uh, if, if you are probably, this is very exhausting because I've heard so much said. Uh, but like I said, where I attended seminary and Dr. John Penn and, uh, well, all the, pastors, professors in the seminary, you would be asked to define your term. Let's just start with reality. Uh, let's be real, for example. Uh, what Define your terms. What is this and what is this? And where'd we get this? And what's from the text? And what do we know as a fact in the gospel, specifically uh, John's gospel, 
there and the purpose of it to be written. Well, the purpose of all the Gospels uh, we can attribute and associate with that um, uh, purpose of John's Gospel. But to have something, to need something more simple, succinct, and specific uh, is to be uh, is to be ignorant of what Paul says, to be ignorant of believe and believing in this verse, which is almost like a, a translation of the perfect tense for us. And then to have John painfully, carefully, specifically place uh, the new birth prior to this continuance, which totally contradicts everything that man-centered assertion, or I should say uh, this uh, fallacious assertions and fallible uh, expressions by the council, general council of the assemblies of God that we're the ones who are the agent and as a responsibility to keep on believing Philippians 129 says we were graced 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 carizo mine and yes, my, my row's up there too high and it should be subscripted and I know better. But in Philippians, there we go. Philippians, oh me, 129, we're graced to keep on believing and to keep on suffering on behalf of Christ. And he said that for us, we, so it's with our interest. Now that's interesting. It's the case of interest. That is for us, it has been, we have been graced. It has been grace for us to keep on. So for those who suffer and those who believe uh, or those who are keep on believing error and suffer for it, uh, that just becomes worse as life comes to a close and then you leave this, depart this world and having rejected the way, the truth, and the life that is Jesus, yeah, rejecting him, if you reject the way, the truth, and the life, then you remain dead. And so it's remarkable that a text that says it's for us, we've been graced to keep on suffering and to keep on believing on behalf of Christ. That's for his glory and for our good. But isn't it interesting that our life value and purpose and that for which we can find uh, value, we find all that in Christ. And uh, what better to suffer for than to say and to preach what Jesus said, to say and to preach what the apostle said, to say and teach what Paul declared of himself, perfectly declared it. So that's good. That's enough. And that would be uh, the free grace movement while I threw in all the things about how these things all come together. So uh, I'll try to get out of the way here and see if you can see all that. And you all are doing a great job in this class. So continue to uh, labor and toil. It's worth it. And Start asking yourself, now why have I been breaking things apart that belong together and why have I not realized the simplicity, simple form of action, uh, the specific nature of this expression and the uh, how succinct it is. So if you want to say something uh, succinctly and specifically uh, and simply that holds the greatest implication for the hearer and for the glory of God and for the good of the hearer, that's it right there. So have a blessed day.